I will, I'll say it, the largest Hindu temple in the world has a dormant function, and we're about to find out what it is. Sit down, because the ancient Hindu thought it was necessary to move 10 million pounds of sandstone to the swampiest marshlands of Cambodia to build these suckers. So they wouldn't sink into the ground. They diverted three rivers and two lakes, creating the most advanced hydrological system known to man. Those reservoirs are five miles long. Hand-dug, man-made, stone-lined pools. This shifted the underground water table around the temples. That monumental effort was needed so that they could align the temples to Draco, the constellation of the North Star at the time. Angkor is the clock of the whole thing. The equinox is tracked by the main tower, solstices by the side towers, in a feat of ancient frequency modulating magic. Ironically, it's in the same shape as a time-tracking oscillator in electronic circuits. The outer walls are a 6 to 5 harmonic ratio, the only ratio you will see in chemical bonds. That's also the crazy long ratio of precession to eccentricity of the Earth and the Sun. Inner temple is then scaled down in the same ratio that the universe considers perfect in how humans perceive it. If we include the moat around Angkor, then it shares the same geometry as a CMOS sensor, which converts light to electricity. Inside, the source of that light and the nine planets, including Pluto, which was not discovered until 1930, are depicted on the walls, which would require a telescope also carved onto the walls, except the telescope wasn't invented until 1608. This reeks of a communication component. Considering at one point it was coated in gold, the evidence is now pointing towards some sort of macro component that may have sustained life. Which is a theory I explore with Proof in Cryptex, which is a brand new book that I just came out with, interpreting the legends of the people considered as myth from a scientific lens, as it should be. Because complex astrophysics in 1150 don't make sense. Today's the last day that it's on sale. Grab it. There. Unless you love the story from the people that conquered them. In that case, wait till tomorrow and we can do this same thing again in Mexico. We need to chat about this. The world's largest temple was laser scanned to remove the trees and these things popped up. So nobody knew about them and nobody is curious about these things. They're not even just at Angkor Wat. There's two more of these things found at Priya Khan, which is nearby. They also appear to be by man-made bodies of water. Just to give you a scale of what we're looking at. This is Angkor Wat, biggest temple in the world. This is Meban. This is the largest man-made moat anywhere. They were clearly good at geometry, but look at when I highlight the lines here. Now, I went to college for computer engineering. I immediately recognized that shape. It could be two things, a piezoelectric generator or an acoustic resonator. In a microchip, that makes sense, but this is two to three football fields long. The piezo generators convert motion to electricity. That conversion is done through materials and geometry. The chip's geometry is not random. You use the laws of nature for efficiency. So the form follows function. A spoon looks the same everywhere on the planet. It's the perfect shape to accomplish the task of getting food into your mouth. So why do our spoons look like their shovels? I've seen these patterns, that's why I look for them. Instead of a separate instruction manual, what if they put that in the design? This perspective wasn't even possible until now, but we're still using the interpretation of hundreds of years ago. That gives us a bunch of shared symbols and a bunch of shared geometry. So all we have to do is use the function of the geometry to work out the meaning of the symbol. And by using their interpretation of the universe, we inch closer to figuring out what this stuff was used for. The evidence for ancient technology is not going to be found near these temples. It's going to be the temple. This is Anchor Wat, and this is a CMOS sensor. Any digital camera will have one of these. That's Anchor Wat from above. What does the CMOS sensor do? It takes in light and converts that light to electrical signal. Why would ancients want to do that? To make that signal usable, we use something called a high-frequency oscillator. These create stable frequencies with no moving parts. They're used in everything. Should be no surprise at this point, the geometry of that oscillator is four resonators around one central resonator. Tesla uses these, which could be confused with ancient Peruvian architecture if you follow me. All resonators work by using cavities to excite and amplify a desired frequency in the center. Let's say we cut anchor like that in half. I feel like it'd probably look a lot like that guy. Picked a great day to watch baseboard. I'm full sending this one. You see that forested area conspicuously covered with trees? We scanned it with a laser on a drone to see what's underneath the trees. You know what they found? What the hell is even that? The acoustic waveguide for our oscillator happens to look just like that. If you watch the Prambanon video, you know that the interior of these temples looks just like a corrugated horn antenna. 
Those peaks are not decorative. They focus the signal as it exits the cone. This minimizes power loss and strengthens the signal. A phased array arrangement focuses the signal into the main horn. That is what the signal looks like, and that may be your design inspiration for a tower. Hindu temples are not for beginners at all. And this one may be the biggest antenna in the entire world. This is Pramanan, and this is what it looks like from the top down. We're going to look at this Shiva temple. Now the layout looks a lot like that thing, and if you don't know what it is, it is the antenna on the cone of a fighter jet. Now, these are smaller cone antennas. If you look at a cross section of the Shiva temple, then you'll notice something very strange. Both the interior chambers and the exterior features share design cues from this modern antenna. The design is called the Corbelled Arch. You can see it in a lot of ancient temples, including the Grand Gallery and the Great Pyramid and a lot of Mayan architecture. We use that design as a waveguide to focus a specific band of frequency. That is the core function of an antenna. Now, Borobudur also shares this core build arch, as well as another feature with Prambadan, these satellite features within the complex. And now I initially thought those looked like a CPU, but now if you overlay a sine wave from the top of the temple to the bottom of the temple, every harmonic of that sine wave converges at the top of the main chamber. Now the amplitude of that sine wave defines the boundary of the last two cones in the temple. Now a phase array is another form of beam focusing. Your cell phone uses something similar. Now, if your main temple is the main frequency, then those satellite features could be directing it. Now that graph is a frequency spectrum of an aligned phase array. That is the circuit diagram for it. Now if our small modern antennas are allowing us to communicate with the whole planet, what is that communicating with? This is a pretty normal looking temple until I show you what it's hiding. So this is the Keshva temple. It's a Indian temple in the Hoysala style. These are the famous temples that have the pillars that look like they were turned on a lathe or they were representing some sort of sound. But to see the wildest part of the whole temple, you have to look up. These are the famous domical ceilings that are made entirely out of stone. These are exquisite, some of the best stonework on the entire planet. But this guy here, now you might be thinking that looks like a turbine. So did I. Especially because there's also pillars in this temple that look like turbine blades. This is where my man Niles comes in. Niles makes wave simulations of all kinds, from acoustic waves to what would happen if an asteroid hit the Atlantic Ocean. Amazing content. There's one, though, that makes a very interesting pattern. It is a water drop, but instead of just a flat plane of water, he introduced these little nodes that break up the wave and cause interference. I'm not sure where the design inspiration for the temple ceiling came from, but if it's not this, then I would be very surprised. Now hold on, this is indicating a function, not just a decoration. Look closer. Those points are how you introduce interference into the wave of the water drop. If you play that simulation backwards, that is the exact way a frontal antenna works. But I thought we were working with water. Look closer again. We have the infamous three-headed snake. In the background of this video, there is something you gotta see. It's from Hoppy India. There are 52 of these pillars in this temple that are tuned to seven notes. As he was playing, I saw one of the notes on the wall. Probably like, that's not a music note. No, it is a frequency, actually. One that we can see with cymatics. Hindu temples are kind of like a book. This pillar, for example, looks like a 3D sound wave. But you couldn't play that or that. It's just showing amplitude. To see the details, you have to look into the sound wave with cymatics. It forms what looks like a flower. Now you have the frequency the pillar resonates at. This is Baalbek in Lebanon. It's a piece of the ceiling. The purple cymatic is a six-fold frequency. In the middle is the flower. The Corinthian order would put the flower on the top of the capital. In ancient Greece, they would put these on the top of the Ionic capitals. Hindu temples are head-to-toe detailed. Highly encourage you to check these out if you have not. The detail will make you question everything. It's like an instruction manual for the universe written in stone. It's truly amazing. That thing has officially turned lead into gold, which means we're back in medieval times. Pretty insane that they called that, but wait until you see how far back this idea goes. There's a temple in India called Dilwara Temple. On the ceiling is one of the most wild carvings you will ever see in any temple. And there's not just one, there's a bunch of these things. They're the most intricate things you will ever see and all of them are different. This one is absolutely massive. It's made of marble, it's 3D, and it's as detailed as a Gothic cathedral. This is the particle collider from the side. If you look straight through it, you see an outer circle and an inner circle. 
look what happens when we use that inner circle with the Delwara temple ceiling. As an engineer myself, I was like, that's a dope coincidence. So I was trying to find what inspired them to carve something like that. If you dig deep enough, you'll discover that the quantum pioneers almost all studied the Hindu tradition. Schrodinger, heavily into Eastern mysticism. Bohr was deeply interested in Buddhist concepts that originated from Hindu philosophy. Heisenberg had frequent discussions with Rabindranath Tagore. He was the da Vinci of Eastern philosophy. The most famous quote from Oppenheimer is from the Bhagavad Gita. Why? Well, the concepts are almost exactly the same. Collapsing the wave function? That's Purusha. Just means consciousness builds the material world. The observer effect, where observing affects the outcome of an experiment, is the eternal witness in Vedic texts. Just Google Sakshi. Non-locality or entanglement is the same as non-duality, the same thing that Schrodinger was studying. How? Superposition, particles existing in multiple states until measured? That is exactly the Atman. Okay, quantum field. It says even empty space isn't empty. Same exact thing as the Akash. It's the field that holds everything together. This one's my favorite, the multiverse theory. Infinite parallel realities. That is exactly how the Lokas are defined in Vedic cosmology. Now, alchemy is an Arabic word. Alchem means of Egypt. Both of these cultures use a consciousness first science. The reason why so many brilliant minds are into this stuff is because what they carved on the walls looks like what we're inventing today. Ancient India rewrites history yet again. Thousand year old caves have just been inspected by stonemasons and engineers and what they found is going to freak you out. These are the Barbar Caves. There's five of them. Carved into solid granite, the polish is so smooth, it's smoother than machine polished marble and slightly less than industrial glass and 20 times smoother than industrial granite. Professional stonemasons were interviewed about recreating this project and how difficult it would be out of 10 and those are their answers. Most said it was impossible. A company called AGP, started by a former stonemason, scanned him with one of these. It's a spinning laser that creates millions of data points that can reconstruct the caves from the inside out with no distortion. Here are the results. The caves have perfect symmetry in the floor, ceiling, and walls. The walls are angled by just a few degrees. Why? Polishing with the aid of gravity is more than doable. That's what we do. Polishing a vertical wall and a curved ceiling, on the other hand, is... The walls have a perfect angle within 0.1 degrees. You can't even tell with your eyes. Why was this necessary? The acoustics of these caves are also ridiculous. Granite barely absorbs acoustic waves and the dome at Sudama resonates at 74.9 Hertz. This renders speech unintelligible in the chamber. Reverb is the time it takes a sound to decay into nothing. 60 seconds is the max my production software will go. Inside Notre Dame, it'll reverb for about 10 seconds. Sudama 62, Vapika is 70. When they were studying the acoustics, they discovered that the angled walls reduce the floating echo. The caves were rediscovered in 1785 by the colonizer dudes. No function of the caves has ever been discovered. The historical foundation is based on this crude hack job into the perfect walls. It says the absolutely perfect caves were used as a rain shelter. We can all agree that there was a lot of highly trained craftsmen that were needed to complete this. Yet we see nothing this precise anywhere else in India. How were they trained? How did they carve it with no electricity? Torches would suffocate workers if they didn't get silicosis. That's an incurable disease from inhaling rocks. Didn't seem like a concern. The only things we can compare it to are Nakshi Rostam, the Lycian rock tombs, Petra, and maybe a couple other sites like Kailasa. Kailasa was carved out of a single rock in traditional Indian style decorated head to toe. This has no decoration and emphasizes the precision. The Rig Veda puts a heavy emphasis on sound. So what were they used for? The clues are in geometry. If you want more clues, check out the documentary this whole video is based on. It's on YouTube and narrated by the lovely Johanna James. Words cannot describe what I'm about to show you. This is a step well, it's in India. Some of them go even 13 stories into the ground. They're like inverted pyramids. If you're like me, I was like, cool, pretty well, whatever. But these are traditional ancient wells. Greece, ancient China, that's ancient Egypt. What makes somebody want to build this when they could easily do something like that? It's India. You know it's gonna be wild. There's 3,000 of these. And the secret, as always, is in sound. So this is a Kladney plate. When you put sand on a metal plate and draw a bowstring across it, it makes geometry. This should look pretty familiar. That's because this is 3296 hertz. That step well is modeled off of this frequency. Obviously it's a square that's gonna line up, but line up the corners to the node on that frequency. Then you have four nodes that correspond to the four stairs going down at the top level of the step well. You can follow this all the way down. Now, if you've read the Vedas, this is gonna be no shock, but Hindu architecture, especially the pillars, are encoded with sound. That pillar in particular shows exactly how sound really moves through the air, and it's in octave ratios if you count the notches. Same frequency as the Wheel of Dharma. Back to the step well. Invert it. Pyramid. 
That is the Pyramid of Djoser in Egypt. They were friends. They worked together, they shared architectural secrets. But look at that thing right there. This is a modern acoustic resonator. That piece regulates the source voltage going into a very small resonator that looks like a very large Tomino temple. Even the top of the temple, after the sound goes all the way to the top, is amplified by a Hemholtz resonator on the tips. India, easily the most advanced ancient culture. You cannot convince me otherwise. If you're gonna start anywhere with temple mysteries, you have to start with India. India has the craziest architecture you will ever see. Half the stuff in the temples spin if they don't float. The pillars in these temples look exactly like the sound wave in 3D. That one's iron. It hasn't rusted in 2300 years. They carved them into mountains and then out of mountains. You can't make a mistake. You have one shot at it. When they're done carving, they put the finest details head to toe in the entire temple. It's everywhere. You cannot get all the details even if you try. Look at this. That's a mandala made out of a snake tail. It's all one tail. That elephant is not an elephant. It's made out of people. That stone is made out of one solid rock. It moves. It's a chain now. They put a rock ball of one stone inside a carving of a different type of stone. It's one piece. How'd they get the rock ball in there? They built pyramids like Egypt and Mexico, and then they inverted it into the ground. Then when they got bored of that, they inverted one of their own temples and built that into the ground. Some of the features inside the temple look like modern technology today. We gotta talk about this. This is a dry river in India, and it revealed these stones, these ancient carvings in the stones. These carvings are called lingams, and in the Hindu tradition, they are very significant to their religious practice. These are in the Shamala River, probably butchering that name, sorry. The pointy part is the lingam, the base is the yoni. You often see these with snakes around them, and sometimes even with bulls around them. Some of these are absolutely massive, and some are carved out of multi-ton, single-piece rocks. When they're inside of temples, you can often find them under these decorative ceilings. But if you find many of them in the wild, they look decapitated. So my man Praveen has done some investigating. Follow him on YouTube if you're not. A recent temple excavation revealed this. Underneath the lingam was specific metals in a specific configuration. They also found these iron spatulas that conveniently never rust. Here is what was underneath that lingam. Inside that pot is rice husk. So Praveen recreated this experiment and used a silver rod and an iron rod in the rice husk in a pot and it created electric current. Putting a bunch of these together, he could light up an LED. Now, lingams are not exclusive to India. They're found all over the world, but I want to focus on Egypt. India and Egypt were close. Now, these are going to make a lot more sense. If you do a quick search for the Baghdad battery, you'll see this pop up. Egypt used this for electricity. You can find this on the walls at the Dendera Temple Complex. The word for bull is Taurus. This comes from the Aramaic word Tor. The Taurus is the shape of energetic flow. The snakes represent vibration, most of the time from the sun. So containing the energy of the sun in a bowl is exactly the concept of a tokamak reactor in our culture. Snake charmers are magicians. They use magnets to magnetically charm the snakes. These are nagas from Cambodia, if you didn't know, but you probably should, because they're hiding a secret. The secret is right there. You wanna know what it is? I'm gonna tell you what it is. Look real close at these snakes. They can be any variation from one to 12, but this one is seven and it's seven for a very important reason. Look at this thing. Now those little guys look like that big circle up there. Why is that? There's seven colors in the visible light spectrum. That's your Roy G. Biv. There's seven octaves in music. This is a wave phenomenon. Now look close at that. Does it look like the Mayan calendar? Does it look like a rose window? Maybe it should because we can decode all of these with cymatics. Now that particular one is a 21 fold cymatic from Anchor Watt. Let's look at another one. This one is a six positive or a 12 fold cymatic from Nik Pien Temple. I'm probably butchering that. Cymatics is how we visualize tones in music through water. Each tone has a glyph. The ancients had a very special way of calculating this. I feel like you should know it.